Good evening, everyone. I love the natural silence that befell the room, clearly indicating that it's 6 o'clock and time to hear from David Weinberger. Um, I am not David Weinberger. I'm John Palfrey. Um, I wish I were. After reading this book, um, I wish I could at least write like David Weinberger. Wow. Um, but on behalf of the Harvard Law School, the Harvard Law School Library, the Harvard Library, um, and lots of others, the Berkman Center in particular, our shared intellectual home here, um, welcome to uh, the book talk for David's amazing new book, Too Big to Know. Um, we have a wonderful lineup this evening, um, not just David, but a few friends, uh, experts who will be responding. Um, in particular, earlier this year, my previous favorite book was Too Much to Know by Anne Blair, professor of history here. Um, and uh, Professor Blair will be um, one of the three respondents. Um, one of the many wonderful things about David is not only has he been a fellow of the Berkman Center and an author and a philosopher, as you may know, and a co-teacher of mine here at Harvard Law School, someone who's accomplished a great deal. He's also been working in the Harvard libraries to help us think about and build innovative things. Um, he's the co-director uh, with Kim Doolin, who I saw earlier of the Library Innovation Lab here. Uh, and uh, so he's working within the system of libraries to affect much of the positive change that he describes in his work, Everything is Miscellaneous, as well as uh, this book here, um, and uh, representing the Harvard Library. The senior associate provost, Mary Lee Kennedy, uh, is also one of the respondents, which is exciting, so ultimately our um, colleague in the system. And last, we will hear uh, also, it's only last because it's his last name starts with a Z, Ethan Zuckerman always gets to go last unless it gets flipped on its head. Um, longtime friend and colleague, extraordinary writer and scholar in his own right, who's recently left the Berkman Center to be head of the Center for Civic Media at MIT at the MIT Media Lab. Ethan, we welcome you back. This isn't really back, but we're thrilled that you're here. Um, so thank you all for coming uh, to this event, and we're uh, excited to hear from everyone. We'll also have time, uh, as David advertises, the expert um, uh, expertise is not all in him, I think is part of the point here. All of you have the expertise. There will be time uh, to hear uh, from all of you, I hope, with questions and discussion uh, after the respondents. I have a bunch of little things which I will note. Um, David will not want me to say this, but I will anyway. Please buy the book, and it's available for sale uh, back here. My guess is that there even may be some other Weinberger titles available. If they're not here, get them from Kindle anyway, um, but too big to uh, know is available. Um, this is being recorded, but not webcast. So if you speak, you will be, um, uh, you are now forewarned that you will be recorded for posterity and shared out, but you will not be immediately um, noted. Um, we will end last question around 7.15-ish, something like that, followed by which there's a reception out in the rotunda. I hope you will stay around. Um, there is a hashtag for those who would like to tweet, and we encourage you to do that, which is 2B2K. David, do you approve? I approve. All right, that's I good. I approve good. That's good. It's an approved hashtag now that ordinarily would have a pound in front of it um, for those who are tweeting. Um, and last, and uh, I think this is kind of fun, David said he will sign things afterwards. And we said, what will you sign? And he said, of course, books. But he actually said, I'll sign anything you want. So if you have <laughs> baseballs, footballs, your shirt, whatever it might be, um, David Weinberger will sign it for you. <laughs> David, thank you for being such a great colleague and for being willing to introduce your book to us here. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Um, Uh, th thank you so much for coming out. Thank you to the Berkman Center for hosting this and to the library system for being one of the world's great library systems. Um, and um, I'll sign almost anything. I would need to put, <laughs> don't want to be tested on that. So uh, um, if you look at the, at the bastions of knowledge, the things that are the very emblems of knowledge in our culture, uh, physical emblems, uh, bulwarks of knowledge, things that you put up because you're proud to be a knower, things like um, encyclopedias. They're, they're all just sort of coming apart. It's, it's quite astounding. In the past 15 years, we have newspapers, which are a proud sign of, of our commitment, our cultural commitment to, to knowledge. They're being re-aggregated, disaggregated, unaggregated. Nobody knows what their future is going to be. Libraries, you ask any librarian and, and he or she will tell you, we know it's gonna be different, we don't know what it is. This, th these are physical uh, public libraries, for example, which are generally look like Greek temples. That, they're a marker in a town of that town's love of knowledge and we don't know what's gonna be happening to them either. And this is actually pretty astounding that these very <laughs> 
symbols of, and manifestations of knowledge are now in play, at risk. We don't, they're falling over. And all that it took was a touch of a little hyperlink, this little bit of technology, which of course embedded in much bigger te technology. But a hyperlink just sort of touched these massive institutions, multi-generational, hundreds, centuries old, and they sort of fell apart. We don't know what's going to happen to them. And so that's the question I want to ask. Why did these institutions of knowledge fall apart so quickly? And of course, I cannot answer that question. I'm going to take one sort of odd path through the territory. But it's an, I think it's an important question to ask in any case, because knowledge in our culture, and I'm only talking about, throughout this entire thing, I'm only talking about Western knowledge. It's, uh, that's it. Um, knowledge has made a promise to us, which is expressed in this, this now famous Senator Moynihan quote, a wonderful quote. It's, uh, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, not his own facts. Well, this we hear, and it brings a certain amount of comfort to us, and it makes a promise. And the comfort is, well, you know, if we all just focus, get together, have a good, honest conversation, we can all come to agreement. Knowledge has made that promise to us in the West from the beginning, restated in the Enlightenment, that knowledge is the thing that will bring us together. There's only one knowledge. We don't have a plural for it. And that's what ultimately will get over our differences. So uh, just a very quick reminder of what knowledge has been in our culture. Um, we have assumed, we have thought that knowledge is some type of picture of our world that we build up bit by bit, fact by fact, idea by idea, until, and they, all the pieces fit together. Right? So we're, and we're doing this across generations. It's a noble pursuit. And each of these pieces is nailed down. And yes, this is the third metaphor out of three slides, I've got one more coming up. So each of these is nailed down with a certainty. It's settled. And finally, um, we have assumed from the beginning that knowledge is a matter of filtering. It's a product of filtering, of winnowing, uh, of first from the stream of perception, which are the true perceptions, and then in the mob of opinion, which are the true beliefs, the opinions being expressed out in the marketplace originally 2,500 years ago. So from the beginning, knowledge has been about filtering and winnowing, finding what is uh, the gold in this flux. Um, so we've done this, especially the filtering idea, for a good reason. We've had to devise strategies based upon an undeniable fact, which is the world is way, 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 way bigger than our skulls. And skulls don't scale. And as we learn more and more, as there's more and more knowledge, our skulls don't get any bigger. So it's a problem that just gets worse and worse. We've known from the beginning there's just too much stuff. There's too much to know, if I may quote Professor Blair. And the world is too big to know. And thus, both titles come together. <laughs> so we have these very small skulls. It's a real issue. And so we've had a strategy that we've been following for about the past 2,500 years, <laughs> which is to break off a brain-sized chunk of the world and to enable an expert to know it deeply and well. And this is, this is truly a noble thing. I mean, we're at a, at a university. We're at a, actually at a very excellent university. And we know ex experts. And there, there's nothing as awesome as, as an expert. But this basic strategy has been too much. Well, OK, then know this really deeply. Know it really, really well. And then we can go to these experts or read their books. And we can ask questions. And we can get an answer. The important thing about this <laughs> is that we can then stop asking. That the system of knowledge that we've built in response to the basic fact that, are, that the world is, is just too gigantic for us has been to construct a system of knowledge that is a system of stopping points. And that's where the efficiency of this system is, this brilliant system that has made us the dominant species on the planet. So this really, really works. But it is a system of stopping points. You ask the question, and you do not have to go on. You do not have to. You got your answer. You don't have to rerun the experiment, redo the research. And if you don't trust the expert, we have a backup system, which is a system of credentials. You say, well, I, hmm, are you sure? Because I don't. Th and then you look on the wall and you say, oh, I see. You got a degree from wherever. And that credential serves as a, a second system of stopping points. Hugely, amazingly efficient system for building knowledge and moving on. We no should not think, however, that that's how knowledge itself is. That's how knowledge works when its medium is paper. Paper for all of its glory, books for all of its, of its glory. I'm going to look at Professor Darnton for a moment. Books for all of their magnificence. 
um, nevertheless are a disconnected medium. It's not what they're good, the one thing they're not good at is connecting to other books because they're stuck between covers and their shelves apart. And this basic fact about books has determined much of how, what we, how we put together knowledge and what we think it is. The, the author has to try to get everything about the topic between those covers because the author understands the readers can't just click and pop out and get the, the information that's being referenced. You pull in a quote, you pull in a, um, a summary of another work because you know the reader can't get out of the book. You have to devise a book so it starts at A and goes through, because it has pages, it goes through all those pages in sequence and brings the reader to Z, to a conclusion. And because books are really quite small, even big books are really quite small compared to what there is to know in the world or for any particular topic, you have to exercise a certain ruthlessness, which we call good writing, in order to figure out what needs to be in the book and what can be cast aside, what needs not be in the book. Because you don't want to distract the, the reader from, from this tour that you're taking her or him on. And so we have devised, we have thought about knowledge as a type of long form argument, for example. Well, you know, books match these characteristics, of, uh, traditional characteristics of knowledge pretty well. It, a book it is some type of picture of some aspect of the world. And it is, of course, highly filtered, both because few books get published and because um, even within the work, you have to reduce what you're going to be talking about to keep it within the covers. And books are printed and settled, therefore. Once they're printed, they're very hard to, it's very hard to get the ink off the pages once it's been published. It's, you don't publish till you have settled things. Books are a way of settling. And they, they go together um, as, a set, as a library. Knowledge is in libraries, not just in books, of course. But books also generally want to move you along this path step by step, brick by brick, through deduction or by uh, providing evidence along each step so that you take each step carefully and you bring your reader along step by step, now the next step, and you get to the end. And when it works, it's, it is magnificent. It is a magnificent and very human accomplishment. But that's how knowledge looks when its medium is paper. Now, obviously, we have a new medium. You can think about links as being a new type of punctuation. The old type of punctuation tells you how to stop, tells you where to stop. The new punctuation tells you how to continue and gives you the means of continuing. In fact, the means of continuing is the smallest possible human motion. If I were to ask you what is the smallest possible human motion, you might raise one eyebrow, which doesn't yet work for changing pages, or you might go like that. Move your finger so little that you can't even see me doing it. And that's all that you need now in order to do what you used to have to do. When you wanted to follow a footnote in a book, you used to have to get on the bus and go to downtown, find a big library, crawl through the shelves and hope that the book is there, which it probably isn't. That's why you don't follow footnotes. It's very rare for somebody. Instead, we use footnotes as a stopping point. They tell us, ah, I see, that's why the, the author said this questionable thing. There is a reason why. But actually following the, foot, the footnotes, even if you're a scholar, relatively rare, because it's a very expensive thing to do. Now, that much, and you have followed the footnote. It's the magic map that we, we dreamt about that not only shows you the world, but you touch it and you go there. So this is a different environment. It's an environment that is all about connection. And in this environment, in this new medium, knowledge, I believe, is picking up the properties of the new medium just as it picked up the properties of the old medium. And I want to look just at four tonight uh, properties of the internet, characteristics of the internet that I think are also now showing up as characteristics of knowledge for better and for worse. And I should say I'm pretty optimistic about this, but uh, it's also, there's lots to worry about. And at the end, I want to come back to the impossibly large question that I posed at the beginning and fail to answer it for you. You're welcome. So the first is that there's, first characteristic of the internet that knowledge is taking on is the recognition there is just too much. There is so much. Clay Shirky, um, of whom many of us are great admirers, I certainly am, uh, put this with his typical brilliance um, recently. There's no such thing as information overload. There's only filter failure. And what he means, I believe, is we, he's trying to pr provide some, some comfort, some historical continuity and comfort to say, well, you know, we, we don't freak out about this information overload thing. We constantly, in our history, we've had periods where we felt this, and it's really just a matter of adjusting our filters. And there's a, another scholar who has uh, done some extraordinary work in this field in a book called Too Much to Know, it, it, Professor Blair, Anne Blair, um, who shows 
this in extraordinary detail and, um, and, and great narrative flow, actually. So, yes, this is something that the world has always been too big for us to know. We go through periods of, of terrible fear because our filters are broken. That continuity is important, but I want to point to two discontinuities as well in the current age. And the first is about how much there is. So this is Alvin Toffler, who, who popularized the phrase information overload in uh, Future Shock in 1970. He didn't invent it. He points out that it was, uh, in fact, invented as a, a follow-on to a term that arose in the early 1950s, sensory overload. And the idea there was that um, if you're at a concert and there's too much noise and smells and touch and all the rest of it, your sensory circuits can get overloaded and you will fall down as a quivering mass unable to respond. Sensory <laughs> overload. And once we decided for Lord knows what reasons that brains are in fact information processors, I, I guess I won't get started, don't even get me started, once we decided that, once information took over the world, then we said, oh, same thing happens when there's too much information. We must have this thing called information overload with the same sort of effect, the falling over quivering. And um, uh, Toffler says, um, sanity hangs upon avoiding information overload. Okay, so very scary, people are very worried about it. Just as in the 60s they were worried about sensory overload because that term was used mainly in contexts to, per, to scare parents about their children's drug use. 1970s, information overload, and we're all getting worried about that. So what did information overload look, in the 19, look like in the 1970s? Well, there was a, market, a study done by some marketers to, to gauge this in 1974, and so they gathered 192 housewives and showed them 16 brands of consumer item, and each of which had 16 categories of inf consumer information, and those categories were greatly reduced, so it wasn't even 120 calories, it was high or low calories. So it was already a reduced set. And they discovered, these marketers, that this much information degraded the poor housewife's ability to make, make good decisions. And so the marketers concluded that therefore they are doing their customers a service by withholding information. And that's what they did. Nevertheless, when we look at this, if I were to ask you what information overload is, there is an article today that in two years there will be an exabyte, not a terabyte, not a petabyte, an exabyte of genomic information. Within one, one field, one category, an exabyte of information. That's what you think about when, these days when we think about, that's what gets, to say, gets us to say, wow, that's a lot of information. We look at this, we don't say, oh man, I, that's too confusing, I can't deal with that. Will somebody reduce it to 12 because my cognitive functions are going down? It's not how, what we think information overload is. What constitutes information overload has changed, and that's a discontinuity from, from the past. Another discontinuity, the second one I want to point to, is the nature of filters. So in the real world, when we filter something, we divide it into two piles and we get rid of the, the dregs, the stuff we are, we are filtering out. So we filter out, people don't see the dregs. So if you are on the acquisitions committee for your local library, you'll make some good decisions about which books. You put them on the new bookshelf, people will come in, they'll be very happy, what a good choice. So what they won't see are the million books published last year that you did not accept. They will not see them piled high in trucks, draped in black, that are silently pulling away mournfully from the loading dock as you deprive your library users of access to those works. They will not see that because that's how Filters work in the real world. We see what's there, we remove what's not. It's not how filters work digitally. So if you do the equivalent sort of activity, which is, let's say, to pick um, your blogging and it's gonna be the 10 best business posts of the week, or whatever, doesn't matter. And so you list them and you talk about them on your site. In filtering them, you haven't removed anything at all. You haven't separated anything at all except that you've reduced the number of clicks that it takes to get to those 10 books. Just takes one click now. Before, it would have taken somebody two, three, four, five clicks, whatever. All of the rest of the hundreds of thousands of business articles published, uh, posted that day on the web, they're all still available. They're all still there. In a way that the, the manuscripts in the old days, the paper manuscripts that got sent into the publishers that the publisher rejected, those are not available. You, you don't know that they're there, and if you did, you, you'd have to find the, the author and hunt her down and, and get her to give you a copy, probably on carbon paper, you know, a carbon copy of, of the papers. That stuff is inaccessible. All the rest of the stuff you did not filter forward 
on, online, it's all there. And may show up in somebody else's blog post, may show up in, in another search result, or in, passed around uh, on a mailing list or whatever. It's all still there. So we filter forward on the web. We don't filter out. And we are constantly reminded of this, because the search engines have an economic interest in reminding us of how much stuff they are not showing us. And so we are constantly having it put in our face in many different ways that there is so much stuff there, and it is all accessible. If it's in this list, if it's on the web, you can get to it one way or another. Maybe hard to find, but you can get there. And so we're seeing a different sort of strategy emerge from the old one, which was to curate. Now, curation is still a, an important, wonderful, incredibly valuable thing. Nevertheless, there's a, another strategy that is being used prior to curation, that enables curation, which is to include everything. The economics of deletion have changed, so that the cost of deleting something frequently is much higher than the cost of keeping it, which is why on your hard drives, if you're like the rest of us, you have thousands of images from your cameras labeled DSC 1099733.jpg. Because it's too hard, it's too expensive to go through and delete them. That, that takes time. Inclusion is often cheaper, and there's a good reason to include everything. I'll put everything in quotes, because you don't really include, but nevertheless, to be very generous in what you include. And the reason is that when you exclude, when you, when you curate, even uh, when you curate, you're making decisions about what things will be interesting to your users. And nobody can predict what every user's interest is going to be. For two reasons. The first is we're, 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 we are really squirrely, and we, you can't know what other people are going to be interested in. If you try, you'll always be wrong. So if you curated this list, let's say it's of news reports, and you took out of it, reasonably, all of the schlocky, gossipy stuff about Lindsay Lohan and, and uh, Britney Spears and the rest of it, you would then have deprived these very serious academics of the research material, the raw material they need to do their research on the media's treatment of women celebrities. You didn't think it was interesting, but you were wrong. And you cannot predict what's going to be interesting to people. And the second thing that you, you can't predict is history. So in this news collection, if you were putting it together this year, uh, a, few, excuse me, a few years ago, you probably would not have included the meetings from the library committee from 1996 in Wasilla, Alaska, because you could not predict 2008. Those meeting notes would actually turn out to be interesting. We don't know. And now that we can, it's so cheap to include, we don't have to try to anticipate quite as much. But if you do that, you now have a big stinking mess that you're presenting to your users, and you need to give them very powerful tools for filtering on the way out, filtering the way that they think about the world, not the way that you think about it. And you can read much of the history of the web as the rapid development of tools for doing exactly that, incredibly powerful tools for end users to use to find within gigantic masses of data exactly what they, what they want. Uh, something that in the early 1990s, um, information retrieval experts were told, would, would have told us ordinary users could not possibly do what we now take for granted. I am not going to go through these tools. I am going to tip my hat to one that I particularly like, which comes out of the Library Innovation Lab, um, uh, which is called Shelf Life, and which provides a visual way of browsing through the 12 million works in the Harvard Library, all 73 collections, in a way that is uh, highly dynamic. And uh, it's a good tool for, um, anyway, so we're really proud of this in, in the lab. So the next characteristic of the net that I think knowledge is taking up is the, the, met, the net is really, really messy. It is, there's, as you know, no organizing principle, um, which is disturbing to us and frequently because we really like order and we're very, very, very good at this point at establishing order. We're really good at it. And not simply, excuse me, not simply so that we can um, find things, which would be certainly enough of a reason, but because we thought that there was epistemological, ontological value in it. We thought we were actually getting at how the world is. And so to know something for thousands of years in our culture was to know its, its place in the universe, its spot in the universal order, the, in the order of things. And most traditionally and typically, Coming out of Aristotle, the order, which is a thing of beauty, um, everything has one spot. It has its right spot. And the person who knows what that thing is knows what that spot is. And the, the spot is one that's defined by its 
essence or definition, which shows the principle by which it's clustered with other things in its category and the principles of difference that dis distinguishes it. Knowing this was to know the world. Not knowing this was to not know the world. To say that there was no order was to say that chaos reigns and God is dead. This was a really serious pursuit for thousands and thousands of years. And one of the reasons to, that this has arisen, that this pursuit arisen, arose, is that it, it works perfectly well. It's the right about how you organize things in the real world. So if you are organizing your physical CDs, if any of you remember what those are, and you and your spouse has a different idea about how to organize them, one of you, at most, is going to win. You can't order, if you want to do it by alphabet, and your spouse wants to do it by genre, you cannot do both, because they're physical objects. Physical objects have to have a place. No two things can be in the same spot at the same time. You have to come up with an order. And so you have arguments about whether Philly Wacko here really belongs in uh, acid visionaries and weirdos or really belongs in British psych. It's not really that interesting an argument to have, but we've been having this argument for a long time, because we had to. And so we have made the really serious and interesting error of thinking that the organization of ideas has to suffer from the same limitations of, as the organi organization of things. It has to be one, one place the things go, one way of ordering. Now, of course, you would not have this argument with your spouse if it was digital content, if digital uh, tracks. You would just make playlists. You'd make two playlists. You'd make 100 playlists, as many as you want, joining the billions of playlists on the planet. Each one adds a little bit of value, because they say, oh, here's an interesting way of clustering. Here's a, princi a principle of organization that contradicts all the other principles of organization, but doesn't matter. Collectively, it is a mess, but it is a rich, rich mess. So that now when we think about the order of the universe, this was, so not only, finding where things go in the order was not only the project of knowing, it was the essential project of being human. Because humans were construed as, from the Greeks on, as being the knowers. That was, what, that was the fulfillment of our essence. These may, these may be feathered bipeds, but we're the rational animals. And so this was a really serious business. But now it just seems silly to argue about what the order is when we have so many multiple layers. We have playlists, we have tags, we have multiple ways of curating and categorizing, and they all add value. Because it turns out that messiness, messiness is, in fact, how you scale meaning. Next characteristic is the internet is wildly unsettled. Um, and so I think that's happening to knowledge as well, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. So uh, what I mean by unsettled is that for every fact on the internet, there is an equal and opposite fact. <laughs> there is nothing that we all agree on. I mean that almost literally. That whatever the fact is, including 2 plus 2 equals 4, you will find somebody who, perhaps not seriously, but perhaps quite seriously, disagrees. We may want to make exceptions for axiomatic systems. I don't care. There is, the, the internet is a stew of disagreement. And anybody who goes on the internet just about, I want to avoid the techno-determinism of saying that the technology itself causes this. Nevertheless, within our culture, within multiple cultures, if you go on the internet, you learn some things. And one of the things that you learn, the internet is at all open, is that we don't agree. We don't agree about anything. And we never will. And my evidence for never will is all of human history. We are not going to agree about anything. And this is actually quite a serious, I'm not saying that all facts are equal and there's no truth. I'm not saying that at all. I fully believe. I, I like facts. I wish we had more and we based more policies on them. But I'm not saying there are no facts. What I'm saying is we're not going to agree about them. People are going to insist on being wrong. We're, so the promise of knowledge that's been held out to us isn't working. It's not that promise is broken. We are not going to. Maybe we should, but we're not going to agree. And the ironic and sort of sad fact is that we don't even know if Moynihan said this and if he did what his exact words were. That's not even a fact. So this, is, this is, should be a cause for some concern, I would say, but not fatal concern. It's something we need to be working on, but we have been. We've been rapidly evolving, just as we've been rapidly evolving uh, new ways of filtering. 
that end users can use that information retrieval specialists 15, 20 years ago would have said were impossible, never be able to filter that much, and you'll have to have an advanced degree in IR, and who's going to, they were wrong about that. Likewise, we've been rapidly developing ways of dealing with difference and disagreement. So I want to give you a couple exa of examples. They're all familiar to you. Um, and the first, this is actually a terrible example, but you'll see why I use it. This is YouTube. This is the new Batman trailer. YouTube is famous for having a really crummy uh, conversational system. The commenting system is, is very hard to go back and forth. Um, so this is last week on this, uh, lots of comments on this. And there were about 30 that were about uh, circumcision, the medical benefits or, or lack thereof of circumcision. In the middle of the Batman thing, it had nothing to do with Batman. <laughs> it was some comment, of, somebody said something about use the word Jew, and suddenly they're off on a circumcision argument. And it was actually fairly learned. It was two people going back and forth, got sort of nasty. So <laughs> if YouTube were a better conversational system, what would have happened is that you, somebody would have said, Basically, just get a room, will you? Just fork it. Fork the conversation. We don't want to stop the conversation, because it's you two are obviously interested in it. Maybe other people are as well. So go off on your own thread, but let us continue talking about the new Batman movie. Forking is a really powerful way of dealing with difference and disagreement. We take it for granted, but it's very hard to do in the real world. If you have six people at a dinner table and two of them suddenly start arguing about circumcision and nobody else cares about, it's very hard to say, why don't you go to get another, go over that table for a little while and talk. You basically have to shut them off. And you don't have to do that on the web. So that's one way of dealing with difference. Another is this. So in the 1900s, excuse me, 1800s, 19th century, we had a very long, heated argument about how to classify this animal, because it was a mammal, basically, that laid eggs, and people couldn't figure out what category, and furthermore, maybe it shouldn't be in any category. It, should, it has to be a hoax, because there can't be something that violates. Even when scientists were shown a dead one uh, brought from Tasmania with eggs in it, they concluded it was a hoax, because it couldn't, couldn't possibly be. So we have this creature. We have a history of not being sure what it is. And now we just sort of don't care all that much. It seems like sort of a waste of breath to argue about whether the platypus. So we do this other thing. And in the Encyclopedia of Life, you can see this being done really brilliantly. Um, we have namespaces. That is a domain in which objects have unique names, which are different, perhaps, from the names in another namespace. And computers can match them. So at Encyclopedia of Life, every species, every organism gets its own page. It has two databases. One is of nomenclature, of names. So whatever you're a scientist or whatever, you want to look this thing up, use whatever name makes you happy. Even, even um, colloquial names, but various scientific, just great, who cares? And if you insist that it has to be classified using this taxonomy as opposed to that one, there are multiple scientific taxonomies, fine, you specify it. They've got a database of them. And it will show you this creature using your name and your preferred taxonomy, great. Get on with your lives. And if two scientists want to collaborate about this thing, they don't have to have the argument anymore about what it is, because they each have their own different namespace. Namespaces are a brilliant way of dealing with difference that allows us still to move forward and even to collaborate. So the internet is made up of all of these differences. Every link expresses a difference. The value of the internet comes from this difference and disagreement. So yay for difference. Yay. It's wonderful. It is. It's where all diverse, uh, all, all, um, all innovation and uh, comes from all true and real thought comes from these differences and disagreements. And we've known this for a long time. So yay for difference. But even though the internet looks a bit like this, so many different types of people and different ideas, the internet as we live in it looks a lot more like this. Not necessarily in terms of race and gender and ethnicity, but in terms of ideas, because we like to hang out with people with whom we agree. Some people call this homophily. Yes, I'm looking at you, Ethan. Um, many people call it homophily. And it, it is a very serious issue, because there is some evidence, the echo chamber argument, that if you um, hang out with people with whom you, you agree, that you're Beliefs get solidified, and not only that, so you become less open, but not only that, you become more extreme in your beliefs. And so the uh, culture becomes more, um, more polarized, and that's exactly the opposite of what um, internet utopians, yeah. sort of like me, were hoping for. So this is a real and serious concern. It's very hard to know exactly, and we ought to take it 
seriously and act against it individually, institutionally, with our children, the educational system, because we do seem to have this natural human desire, comfort, to stay with that which is familiar to us. Nevertheless, there are important, serious questions about this, questions that make this entire formulation to me seem um, something's wrong with the way this question is being posed. And I think it has something to do with the assumption that real, and this, is, this assumption comes from the Enlightenment, that uh, if not before, that real conversations are conversations among people who disagree deeply and who are able to dig down and get to that fundamental factual level that Moynihan promises us. And any conversation other than that is not a real conversation. It's just making small talk. And what, what that misses is the social role of conversation. It misses the fact that we have to have so much, to have a really great conversation in which minds are changed and opened, we have to agree so much. There is so much we have to agree upon. We have to speak the same language. We have to be interested in the same topic to talk about it. We have to have a, some basic set of, 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 of common facts and values. We have to have the same norms for conversation. There, in order to have a good conversation, we have to have 99% similarity and 1% difference. It's got to be the right percent difference. I made up the numbers entirely. They have no actual meaning, okay? but a huge amount of similarity. And so I'm not going to pursue this question. I don't know how to pursue it, but there are people who have done magnificent jobs raising questions about it. <laughs> if only we could <laughs> identify them. So uh, certainly Ethan Zuckerman and Yochai Benkler have been uh, magnificent in this discussion. Um, and Ethan, we're all looking forward to your book. Um, okay, next characteristic, and um, last, which is going to take me, unfortunately, a little bit, um, is that the internet is unstructured. And by that I mean, you know, our idea of knowledge, a, a property that knowledge is taking on, so our old idea of knowledge is that it has a basic, basic structure. The pieces go together. We're, it's like a jigsaw puzzle or bricks. And furthermore, th this type of long-form argument where we start with some premises and we walk carefully and slowly to get to the conclusion that preferably surprises or opens the eyes of, of the reader, takes the reader someplace that she was not expecting to go, a belief she would not otherwise have had. This is a magnificent form of thought. We don't know of any other creature that is able to do this. And yet, there, there's a lot to be said about this. I'm going to say only a little. I think that. And this is something we may want to talk about, that long form argument, sort of book length argument, and yes, I did write a book, I got the irony, fine, that long form argument is losing its preeminence as the way, the highest, the pinnacle of human knowing, of human thought, is to see into God's deductive mind, that God sees the world as the sequence of events and ideas. And insofar as we can capture that in our own humble way, we are in our creator's image. That idea of knowledge is losing its preeminence. It's not going away. It will always be a valuable way of thinking, but it's losing its preeminence. So if you are Darwin, who wrote one of the truly successful, magnificent, long-form works, one that did convince people of something they had not expected to believe, if he were writing now, he well might write that same work. But it would be on the web. It would be posted on the web. If it weren't posted on the web, it would be discussed on the web. That's where the discussion would be. And one hopes, in fact, that he would be blogging along the way, that he would be tweeting from the Beagle, his findings on the Beagle. And people would be chiming in and saying, hey, something funny about those beaks of those. How do you explain that? And the conversation would have started. And he would have uh, encountered people who object, who add to, subtract to, get it wrong, get it right, apply it to new fields in ways that are brilliant or, or dumb, uh, to commercial, would have become commercially interesting to the travel agents who are booking tours to the Galapagos. That this web, which includes Darwin's original long form work, has more value than the work itself. That this is where the thinking happens, this is where the knowledge lives. If you want to understand Darwin in the 21st century, the 21st century Darwin, you will have to see not just her or his work, you're going to have to see the web that it inspires. And if you want a real example of this, and I am here going to channel Michael Nielsen, whose book um, Reinventing Discovery is really, really good. He was at the Berkman Center a few weeks ago uh, and gave this example. So the faster than light neutrino findings, from data that came in that threatens to overthrow relativity theory. And if you want to ask me questions about that, I am at the end of my knowledge. Nevertheless, leave it at that. 
So this, these findings come in, they get posted at archive.org, which is a preprint site. Any scientist can post whatever she, she wants there. They post it there. Immediately, it stirs up a firestorm of interest. And people from all over the world are posting. 80 papers are posted in response at Archive, but it spills out into the blogs and the mainstream media, the minor stream media, everywhere. People explaining their own theories, their own evidence, some of which are, is brilliant, some of which is stupid and wrong. Explanations at every level of the stack. Explanations for experts all the way down to people who don't know relativity theory and don't have the math at all, which would be me. This whole ecology of knowledge, this one paper spawned an ecology of knowledge, knowledge that, was, that filled just about every niche. This is where the knowledge was developed. This is where the knowledge lives. And if you, even once this question is settled about whether neutrinos do in fact go faster than, than light, if you want to understand this issue, you're going to have to go onto this web. And you'll never traverse this entire web because this entire web is by itself too big for any one person. Nevertheless, this is where knowledge is. It is not contained in the book. All of this was done outside of peer review, outside of printed peer review journals. That's where knowledge is. It's at the level of the internet. But this, la this, this destructuring of knowledge, I think, is happening not just um, at that level. It's also happening at the level of the facts or the data themselves. So Darwin, uh, 1846, for the next seven years, studied barnacles. This was before he got around to publishing. This is when he was in his postponement phase. He studied barnacles. He dissected them to discover if they were mollusks, as Linnaeus had thought, or whether they were, uh, whether they were crustaceans. Seven years, little dissecting in instruments, coming to dinner smelling of formaldehyde every night, and dead seafood. Nice combo for the kids. So he finally he worked it out, published big two-volume two work on the topic, settled that hash. That's what facts were like in the 19th century. They were, they were acts of, discovering them were acts of nobility. It, um, so hard, so rare to find. Not like that quite anymore. So, no, th those are barnacles, sorry. <clears throat> We're seeing the same sort of destructuring happening at the level of facts. And so we're seeing in field after field after field, we're seeing clouds of, of data. We're seeing data commons emerge with clouds and clouds of massive amounts of data, whether it's in genetics or astronomy or government data or libraries have been jumping onto, this, onto these clouds as well. These data clouds are fundamentally different than, um, than facts in a few ways. So the, which I'll point to very quickly. Uh, the first is that, for example, at data.gov, which is uh, President Obama's very first act was to um, call for openness of data, and this is one of the results, uh, data from federal agencies are supposed to be made public quickly. And so data.gov, which is the site that was established, um, announces that it's providing to us, to the world, raw data, uncleaned up, unnormalized, some of it can be wrong or misleading because even though everybody would prefer perfectly clean, normalized, standardized data, of course, it doesn't scale. You won't get it. It will take the agencies 20 years before they are able to go through this massive amount of data. So it's better the decision was made, and this is quite typical in the cloud space these days, better to have raw data that may have inconsistencies and may be wrong in some, some ways than to wait. If you want to scale up, you got to get the data in raw, in raw form and be happy with it. That's not what Darwin would have said. Darwin spent seven years on one fact. But it turns out there is tremendous value in, in getting all of this data out. That's how you scale data. And likewise, there's tremendous value in getting our information out quickly in the form of articles, this is archive.org again, um, that are outside the peer review system. Because peer review doesn't scale. There's wonderful things about peer review. There's some well-known problems. It can, it, can, uh, put, it can keep in power a small elite, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's true. But there are wonderful things about peer review. But it, one thing that is, is bad about it, it does not scale. You cannot scale science quickly enough. You cannot scale research quickly enough through peer review. Unless, perhaps, it's a type of peer-to-peer -peer, peer review, which we also see emerging. 
Um, we, the evidence of this is in the, the dual growth of, in the open access field of um, both journals, open access online free journals that are peer reviewed because there is tremendous value in that. They're, they're just not eliminating, rejecting stuff because the topic is too small. If it's good science, then it'll go, get into the peer reviewed open access journal. But there's also open access repositories, which are generally not peer reviewed. And there's value in that as well. There's value in both. But if you want to scale, that's how you have to do it. The third way that data is changing from facts is that it's linked. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but, um, so I'm going to try to do it as quickly as I can. If it's not clear, then I apologize ahead of time. But this is um, linked data. Linked data is a format that is recommended by Tim Berners-Lee, who you may remember gave us the web for free, the copywriter patent. In linked data, these clouds are con consist of data that uh, has th three parts. It draws a relationship between two things, thus they're called triples. So oh, good, so that's interesting. But the really crucial part is that if, if you're a computer and you want to start making sense of these clouds, because these clouds are too big for the cranium, you've got to use computer power on them, you want to make sense of them, you, may not, you won't know that a platypus is the same thing as a water mole, is the same thing as an ornithorhynchus. You won't know that ahead of time. And so this data doesn't come together. Therefore, the right way to do linked data, the part of the spec, is that you point, oh, I have a pointer, that you point each of these terms to some reference on the web. You, the, the, the term is a link. This points to something, Tasmania points to some geographic reference. And that way, if these two clouds have data pointing at the same page in Encyclopedia of Life, computer can figure out they're the same thing. And if this person over here points instead to the Tasmanian field guide, and somebody on the web somewhere maps the two, the Encyclopedia of Life and the field guide, so that we know that this page there is that page there, then the computers can start making all sorts of connections and assumptions. This is pretty exciting. It's quite astounding in the library world, for sure. But it changes the fundamental nature of facts. Facts used to look like bricks. Now they're links. They are fundamentally, in their nature, at their heart, linked. And so these changes in the structuring of knowledge are they're happening fractally. They're happily, happening recursively, all the way down from the higher, highest ends of the collection of knowledge down to its very elements. They're getting linked, messy, destructured. It is a properly recursive or fractal system. So back to the question I can't answer. So why were our old knowledge systems, which serve us so well, so fragile? I don't know, but here's one guess. If you look at the um, traditional properties of knowledge, and I see in my last revision, I screwed up the animation. So just take it from me. For me, I'll read them. Uh, that it's bounded. Knowledge is bounded, typically in books. It's settled, it's orderly, it's step by step, and it proceeds through reason. Very different from the properties of knowledge in the age of the internet, where it's, it's so much, it's overwhelming, it's unbounded, it's unsettled, it's messy, it's linked, and it's based on uh, the connections are drawn by passion and interest. Well, OK, th these are properties of knowledge. That's what I'm arguing in the linked age. Uh, there are also properties of the internet in the linked age, because that's my argument. You know, that uh, the internet as a medium is conferring its properties upon knowledge that lives there. But these are also properties of what it means to be human in a world. It's always, we didn't need the internet to discover this. This is always what it's meant to be a human in the world, trying to live in it, perhaps trying to know it. And so I want to draw two very quick conclusions. The first is that network knowledge may or may not be truer about the world. I think there are good reasons to think that it is, and I would make that argument. Not always, of course, but that it's letting us know the world truthfully in ways we couldn't before. But leave that aside. We can argue about that. May, network knowledge may not be truer about the world, but I think it is clearly truer about the nature of knowledge. And that is, a, I think, an important reason why this crazy knowledge that we see on the internet feels sort of familiar to us, feels home-like to many of us. And the second conclusion I wanted draw is that the, the old dream is not going to work because what we have in common is not one knowledge about which we all agree. We don't. Now we know it. 
we can hear it, we can see it, that we don't agree. What we have in common remains a shared world about which we disagree. So if there is going to be a peace offered by knowledge, the old dream, it's going to be a very, very noisy peace. Thank you. David, thank you. Um, even for ending on a downer of a note, we have to find a way to pick yeah. back up. Only if noisy peace is a bad thing. I, I think it's actually a noisy peace is a joyous peace. So oh, I, I'm actually happy about it. All right, that's good. <laughs> Glad to know. We can be happy about that. Um, so we have one of your classic problems here, which is there are three human beings, and we have to find a way to order them. I was thinking <laughs> alphabetical or reverse alphabetical, but if you have any insights based on this book, I, I can do it otherwise. I, I stand in such awe and trembling of this, uh, this panel that I, uh, well, I, think I can I offer enough. I'm speechless. Highly conventional, <laughs> and I'm going to ask Professor Blair with her B to go first, if that would be okay, yeah, and then Mary Lee Kennedy and Ethan Zuckerman third. So um, you're most welcome to come on up or to do it right from there as you, as you prefer. I'd be glad to give you the mic. Thanks so much. So as the author of Too Much to Know, I have to start by Thanking you for such a great title, <laughs> Too Big to Know, and not only that, but the great subtitle, which is even more absurdly long than mine. <laughs> so I hope that there will be users seeking one of our books out of confusion, find the other, and will linger and find something of interest, because I think, in fact, we are talking about um, similar issues from very different vantage points, of course. So I just want to pick up uh, on some of the early parts of your, your book, which actually I notice uh, some of the Amazon users have noticed, is the pyramid of knowledge you talk about in the 50s. Computers generate data on punch cards and uh, software promises you data management to produce information. In the 80s, we have tons and tons of information. We look to something to bring us knowledge. Here we are 30 years later, we've got Wikipedia, which brings us a fair amount of, a lot of information certainly, and a fair amount of systematic knowledge. And of course, now what we want is wisdom. And the question is, in 30 years, will we be turning to the room or the net for that? Um, I suppose we'll just have to wait and see. Um, so with that uh, pyramid from data to information to knowledge to wisdom over the last you know, 50 years, uh, I'd like to think back to the previous 2,000 years of how we got to the idea that so much stuff was worth bothering about. And so maybe I'll, you, you started with the Acropolis, so I'll, I'll put Plato in our mental uh, map. And his idea is the purpose of life is wisdom. And wisdom, of course, Socrates is the wisest of men because he doesn't think he's wise and he doesn't think he knows anything, basically, or he, he doesn't overextend what he knows. So in that mindset, um, a lot isn't really such a great thing. What you want is wisdom. Um, and of course, there have always been proponents of that view, early Christians were among them too, that faith and lifestyle were more important than knowing a lot of things. But I would say then we have Aristotle, one of Plato's students, coming along and offering as a goal for philosophy episteme or scientia, certain knowledge. And he's going to use syllogisms and observation to build up philosophy in its many branches, rhetoric, ethics, physics, metaphysics, and so on. And that's of course the form, the disciplinary format of learning uh, with some hiccups uh, down to the late Middle Ages. Late Middle Ages is when the term information first is used in English, uh, mainly with a legal connotation, but over time also applying to what Francis Bacon would call all those facts that we should be gathering, even if we don't know what we're really going to do with them. Uh, and that's, of course, the period that I've studied in my book about reference books, which gather up, it's not the term they use, but I think it, it applies conceptually, information, stuff that you can use then in your writing or your uh, speeches or your sermons to make knowledge from. And uh, so the era of information explosion already is, is well commented on for the 18th century, an area, a time when there were many, many reference books and encyclopedias, and the term information really took off. And that's the precisely the period when data is first used in English, uh, although mainly in theological and mathematical contexts as givens rather than assumptions or presupposita. And then, of course, data has to wait until the 1950s to really take off as a term. So this is all thanks to some great work being done by Paul Duguid and Dan Rosenberg on those terms, and of course, a little boost from uh, Google Ngram viewer and so <laughs> on. Um, so 
that's, that's the other pyramid, the, the inverted pyramid. It starts from a very small idea of what we want, which would be wisdom, to certain knowledge, then to all kinds of things, even if we don't know what we're to make of it, and on to basically raw data, stuff generated automatically by instruments uh, that then needs processing down. Um, so I suppose I'm putting a plug in for uh, our two stories of information overload and what I see they have in common, in fact. Uh, you've emphasized the differences, but it seems to me from my early modern work that the impulse to accumulate, to save, uh, is already very present there. And, and some of the mantras of the folks I've worked on were, no book so bad that some good cannot be gotten of it, which of course is, uh, is taken out of Pliny. Uh, Pliny, the younger's description of how um, his uncle worked and uh, the other mantra by an abundant note taker from the 17th century is that he would write everything down lest it be forgotten in the hopes that it would advantage someone someday. So I think we are still in this economy of uninterrupted accumulation. There haven't been the kind of catastrophic civilizational losses that characterized the end of the Roman Empire and that uh, the Encyclopédie of Diderot d'Alembert was ready to jump in and save uh, in case of catastrophic loss, you could reconstruct all necessary knowledge from their 17 volumes was the claim they made. Um, so I see continuities uh, to, to a great extent. I just want to talk a bit about your book and what I see as a great strength. Um, I emphasize three great qualities. There are many others, of course. It's nuanced. It's neither techno-deterministic nor supersessionary, and it's optimistic. So as David pointed out in his uh, eloquent talk, the net doesn't filter out the way the process of paper production does. The good news is, of course, that all kinds of things that wouldn't have gotten to print into print are on the web. And I have to say, at 6 a.m., trying to tie a tie for my son off to a debate tournament, I don't have a book that tells you how to tie a necktie. YouTube, you know, multiple computers running multiple videos. And of course, as it really happened, the room kicked in in the bus when someone else tied it for me. <laughs> Um, this is, you know, husband asleep, and the husband doesn't know how to tie a tie either, um, I think, at this point. So, yes, you can find all kinds of great stuff on the web. And, of course, the downside, though, and this is where the nuance comes in, is you can find data and authoritative uh, statements to support any position. So there's no hiding the conclusion that once authoritative-seeming facts or arguments are no longer objective or universal, so what you can do then is make your work transparent, show where you get your stuff, show where you're coming from, your links, uh, and experience the diversity, ec uh, e exiting your echo chambers every so often to uh, tour the world a bit. That's nuance. A second point is um, I love David's model of avoiding techno-determinism. The net looks different in different parts of the world. Even in Europe, Google Books pulls up different uh, materials than in the US. And of course, the web looks very different uh, in countries with serious censorship. It looks different to users within a single political system. And secondly, it isn't an argument about supersession, uh, although in the talk I felt a little bit more of the supersession argument, but um, in, on, in the book, uh, David's account doesn't see the net as replacing uh, the old institutions of knowledge. Rather, as he puts it, it's about putting them in a new and broader context. And what those institutions that come to my mind, of course, are schools, universities, peer-reviewed journals and granting processes, libraries, uh, and I hope that others will appreciate that there would be serious consequences to thinking that the net can stand in uh, for uh, those institutions. Finally, this is an optimistic book. Yes, the net has problems. Some of them are built into the diversity of human experience and the democratic use of the net, and we shouldn't seek to fix them. We should know what the net's good for and not try and make it into something it isn't. But some things can be improved. And uh, that's where the call for metadata, uh, data forming data commons, participating in the collective process of uh, knowledge formation. I'd just like to close maybe on, for a call, since we're, a lot of us are educators, whether in libraries or in schools, universities, it seems to me I, I do hope that we are imparting mental maps and the wherewithal to make judgments, because that's what um, everyone's going to need out there. I, I'm not sure that a completely unstructured vision of the world is really what helps one navigate the net, although, of course, I'm not of the born digital generation. I, I do worry, so my second son, who's younger, you know, the elementary school teacher says, never use Wikipedia. But that's not actually the solution. 
And of course, it seems the teacher just seems like a hypocrite when, of course, we all know she's using it too. <laughs> uh, well, certainly I am. Um, so what do we need? We need the teacher to explain the, how you weigh, uh, how you notice discrepancies and how you reach judgments about discrepancies, how you look elsewhere for other sources. And that, I suppose, is a matter of having a mental map um, with which to navigate. We, my, my hope that these things get constructed, I no doubt in new ways, but nonetheless constructed in the order that lies ahead. Thanks. Professor Blair, I think you are much like Socrates in the sense that you always state things in such a nice, understated, humble way, and yet, of course, you say a great deal, so thank you for that. Um, and along with teachers who put things into context, we all know that librarians put things into context and are much needed and not any less. In fact, in my view, more needed today than in the past, and we have a great one among us, Mary Lee Kennedy. Thank you. Hi, David. I think I'm just going <laughs> to sit here if that's okay. First of all, I want to thank you for putting into long form what many of us have been struggling to put into some form for quite some time. You have connected dots, and you have offered us, if this, then possibly that. I'm reading several books at the moment, and I'm also interested in the fact that what I'm reading is in very many ways connected to some of the themes that have come up in your book. One of them is really about um, why do these institutions fall apart? It's, it's a hard question, and there are many people in this room who have been studying this in, um, in depth. But the question stems from the fact that these uh, institutions that were created in just creating enormous amounts of disruptive change and unsettling to civilization in proportions that no one could have imagined, this is not news. This has been happening to us for quite a long time. And so the question really is, what are we going to do about building a knowledge infrastructure? And this is the part of the book that I have focused on today. So in your book, you talked about a new shape of knowledge, knowledge on the net. And I love these words, which is knowledge is lumpy, intertwiningly networked, contained in a web of ideas conversations and arguments, all linked and traversable. I mean, you must love playing with words. <laughs> but there are still all these tensions between truths and untruths. And you've provided a thoughtful review of real advantages and disadvantages of both forms. You showed us what makes it harder for us now is really that we don't have any foundation on which we can all rest for very long. And so for those of us in this kind of field, that's an opportunity and a challenge. And so today, as Professor Darton and I often discuss, we are caught in a time warp between the long form book and the net knowledge revolution. And we're really not sure where it's going. We are entering though into a new shape of knowledge. One we really don't have a handle on yet but by its very nature, this new shape of knowledge is challenging the way we think about the world and how we make sense of it. And people are asking, are our brains changing? So there's this other book I've been looking at, which is called Thinking Fast and Slow. And it's all about two modes of human thinking. Mode one is based on sort of this automatic, automatic pilot, if you like where there's not a lot of sense of voluntary control. And in general, if we ask somebody, answer this phrase, two plus two equals, the vast majority are going to just jump into an answer of four. But mode two asks us, think hard about this. And so it might be something like, how many times in David's presentation did the letter A show up? We have to think hard about that. And so is the net, actually amplifying one mode over the other is my question. Is the way we're actually thinking about knowledge and how we jump from one thing to the other affecting the way I think fast or slow? Or is it because I think fast and slow that I work differently on the net? Is the note net really making us stupider or smarter? 
and you astutely advise us, we will only settle these questions by living through them. <laughs> I've just started another book by Kathleen Fitzpatrick called Planned Obsolescence, Publishing, Technology, and the Future of the Academy. And it's too early for me to share with you anything insightful, but it seems apropos to the creation of a new infrastructure for knowledge that we have to understand these issues as well. And so as an information professional who has enjoyed your book enormously, and if you don't know, I've written, I think, on almost every page, I am looking forward to thinking about and working on ways that you mentioned, enabling an infrastructure that enables connections and curations of the abundance leveraging the collective intelligence that creates credentialed knowledge, contributing to the wild connectivity of the net, exploring the explorations, enabling the exploration of differences and thereby improving learning, and building bridges between long form and network knowledge, which will be here for some time to come. Needless to say, David, you have given us plenty to think about and it is fascinating. And you have even proposed ways to take advantage of the net strengths. And so I ask myself, what are we waiting for? Seems like the only way forward is to embrace the future and lead on. So thank you for setting such a bright and bold <laughs> example. Thank you. One of the great pleasures of the last 10 years of my life is summed up in the single day of Tuesday. <laughs> Anybody involved in the Berkman Center knows immediately what I mean, which is that's the day in which people tend to come in person, in physical space, to the Berkman Center for lunch, and then fellows often stick around and have debate. And one of the reasons why Tuesdays are so deep and meaningful to me is um, having watched a conversation, listened to a conversation, been part of a conversation with David Weinberger and Ethan Zuckerman, two of the great, um, truly most successful, there are many other wonderful ones, Doc and others in the room, uh, fellows of the Berkman Center. Um, and this conversation, which I'm looking forward to hearing a bit more about here, is one that's taken the form almost of what you have in your book, which is you've written, you've published together in various ways, in very formal uh, kinds of uh, formats. You've talked a lot, but you've also tweeted at one another and blogged at one another and argued like crazy in all of these different networked ways. And so it's almost perfectly fitting that in sort of the oldest school academic way, here we are face to face hearing you critique his book. I look forward to yet another great critique. Ethan Zuckerman, thank you for being here. Thanks, JP. And <coughs> thank you, David, for, uh, for writing something so wonderful and giving us the chance to, to react and think. Uh, and engage with these ideas. Um, l let me say that when I, when I moved on uh, from Harvard to MIT, it was in part because they'd initially uh, promised me the chance to lead a department of Weinberger studies. Uh, I'm planning on holding them to that a little bit later uh, or perhaps coming here and, and working on it. But a as I think about David's work, I I'm going to characterize this perhaps as the book that shifts us from the early Weinberger to the middle Weinberger. Uh, and, and, and I'm going to suggest that you know it may be the early middle in part because I'm, I'm hoping for my friend's long and productive uh, career, but also because I really think that David is opening up in this book uh, this really vast and somewhat scary chasm. And I want to slightly disagree with, with my two colleagues, which is I, I don't think this is a happy book. I, I, I think we're, we're sort of smiling our way through this book in part because David is, is basically a stand-up comedian as well as a philosopher of great depth. But you know, we've just had a very smart man stand up in front of us and tell us that um, facts are not what we thought they were, uh, that consensus on knowledge is not something that is uh, perhaps even achievable, uh, and, and that this notion that somehow the solution to a left-right divide or a multicultural divide is that we can all sit and talk it through and we're going to end up in the same place. And if that doesn't leave you unsettled, which is of course unsettling knowledge, the title of this talk, I, I'm not quite sure what will unsettle you. So I, I want to go to what I think is David's fundamental insight on this in some ways, which is that when we tend to think about some of the revolutions that have taken place over the last 20 years, there's a real tendency to think of these revolutions in financial terms. You know, what killed the Boston Globe? Well, you know, the classified ad market fell out and, you know, suddenly everybody moved to the web. And, and what David is really saying is, put economics to the side. You know, economics is all well and good. It's very exciting. What really kills the Boston Globe 
is that the nature of what happens in the world, the nature of facts itself, is being changed by two abilities. The ability for all of us to have our say in one fashion or another, and the ability to link it together and to be able to find it. And in some cases, it doesn't hugely complicate a fact. In other cases, it massively complicates a fact. And I think if we really take seriously the argument that David is making, it's deeply unsettling. He's not making the argument that we simply can't make money producing encyclopedias or newspapers anymore. He's making the argument that the notion that we are going to put something authoritatively in print, like a book, and sort of say that's where we stop, is an absurdity at this point in time. And, and if we take that seriously and we really wrestle with this, uh, I think that puts forward an amazing challenge. And I think it's an amazing challenge that David sort of gives us road signs towards, but I think, you know, as, as Doc Searles was saying earlier today, we're, we're three nanoseconds after the Big Bang, right? If this is a change as big as knowledge is no longer shaped the way it used to be, it's going to take us a very, very long time to figure out how to navigate our way through this. Um, so what I, what I want to suggest is that the happy consequence of this is that there really is the possibility of knowing the world in a very different way. And it's knowing the world in terms of being able to both cope with the set of facts that you're working with and fully understanding and accepting that there are others out there that believe two plus two is five just as passionately as you believe that two plus two is four. And, and on the immediate surface, that, that sounds you know, sort of like a logical challenge. I mean, obviously there's gotta be a fallacy there. We've gotta work through our logic. But I think the deep challenge that David is putting forward is the notion that to really understand in this linked world is to understand that we are somehow taking part in, in the piece of this. We're getting on with our lives with the piece of interpretations and the piece of facts that we can deal with, but we're also accepting the full complexity of all that's out there. And, and those of us who really figure out how to navigate this new linked space, this new space where, where facts are not the fixed things that we thought they were and where knowledge isn't the thing where we can sit down and simply argue our way to it, gives the possibility of succeeding in a very, very different way. And so now I, I want to make an economic analogy because I think David's book pushes me in sort of the same direction and towards one of the, the, the same very difficult questions to answer in sort of one of the favorite ideas that I've encountered in the last year, which comes from Ricardo Hausman, who's put forward this lovely book uh, called The Atlas of Economic Complexity. And what Hausman, who continues to try to figure out what went wrong when he was the planning minister of Venezuela, um, is trying to think about is, is how do you think of economies in terms of what they're able to produce? And what he ends up saying is think of this in terms of person bites. It takes a certain amount of knowledge to know how to print a book on paper. It takes a certain amount of knowledge to know how to bind a book. It takes a certain amount of knowledge to know how to write a book. And at a certain point, your entire embodied knowledge, the sort of expertise that, that David is talking about, that's a person bite. So it's taken a, 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 a person bite, a, a, an extremely bright person bite, to be able to create the text for this, but it also requires many more person bites to figure out how you actually produce this and distribute this and get this printed and so on and so forth. And Hausman argues that you can basically figure out what economies can and can't do based on how many person bites of knowledge you have in them. If you have knowledge that only allows you to uh, make leatherworks, you're not in a very advanced economy. Whereas if you're an economy that allows you to make a MacBook, you might be bringing together thousands of person bites about metallurgy and about circuit design and so on and so forth. And so his hope is that we can somehow understand economies by lining up an ex experts. If we have the expert metallurgists and we have the expert designers, we line them all up together and we're at a certain level of economic complexity. But then he sort of says, well, wait a second, obviously it doesn't work that way. What really works is that somehow we find some way to have the knowledge, the knowledge of what it means to make this MacBook, which is somehow living between all of those experts, between all of those minds, all those different perspectives, all the different ways of viewing things. And when you try to look at the world in terms of that complexity, I think it starts forcing you into this question of not knowledge as, as a single thing known by one person in one place, but knowledge as a process, and knowledge as a group of people trying to figure out the working definition, what we're going to stand on at the particular moment at the time. So in the same way that I'm counting on Ricardo to sort of solve the problem of how economies move forward from getting from a few experts to a complicated economy, what I'm really hoping we're going to get out of the middle 
Weinberger, and someday the later Weinberger, is more help in helping us sort of figure out now that we've really had these, uh, these supports knocked out from under us, now that we know that it's not enough to simply assume that Republicans are just wrong and eventually they're going to come around and agree with us or vice versa, but that really we are dealing with a world in which we have to deal with the entire web and the entire complexity and the entire linkage of knowledge, just the absolute truth, how we navigate this, how we discover, how we get along and how we move forward. I think it's the sort of question that if you really pay attention to is deeply uncomfortable and deeply unsettling, which makes it perhaps the most sort of exciting question you can actually wrestle with. And where I think David makes his strongest case is that that old form of knowledge where we simply pin it down and we say this is it, this is a fact and we know it, that's always felt a little strange. That's always felt a little weird. It doesn't feel like it, it describes our world very well. The world that David's describing is much messier. It's much harder to navigate. It's much harder to figure out how to plot our course. But by helping us try to wrestle with that very messiness, I think David's done us an enormous favor. He's pushed us off into the deep end. I think that's what's so wonderful about this book, and I think that's what's so wonderful about my friend as a thinker and a writer. David, obviously this topic is too big to discuss only in 75 minutes. Um, and since the room is also the smartest part, would you be willing to take a few questions even though we're going over by No questions. Minutes? No, no. Yeah, I'd be very, okay. I'd be I'm delighted. I'm sorry for too. stretching yeah. the time a little bit. Yeah. I know people I'll would like to get to the reception. Answers, it will be not, not rude to walk out now if you need to, but um, maybe just, uh, should we maybe stack up a few comments and then you respond or how would you like um, to do it? Sure. Okay, why, why don't we have at least three comments and then David can um, respond with a final note. And, and in the interim, I, I, um, this, is, this is like the, the nightmare roast where you have incredibly smart, sweet people saying nice things about you. And uh, yeah. thank you so much. It, and it, disagreeing it was, a little bit, a little, maybe, here yes, and there, absolutely. only gently. Yeah. There must be some comments. We've bought enough time for that. Or people would really like a drink outside, apparently. <laughs> yes, please. And um, if you wouldn't mind, press your uh, red button, and then you will be uh, Amplify. Okay, am I on? All right. Um, what I'm hearing in all of this is a, a philosophical challenge uh, to our notion of truth. And uh, I'm wondering if in your book or you know, if uh, maybe tonight you could elaborate on uh, some, of the, some of the traditional definitions of truth and how we might be changing which one of those we subscribe to, whether that's a good idea, have, at the risk of you know, setting myself with a, uh, with a conundrum, have we gotten truth wrong? Um, so this is not the sort of yes-no question I was... <laughs> <laughs> you didn't write that kind of a book, David. <laughs> <laughs> should, I, should I respond? Or I, okay. It so, seems uh, hard to um, stack something up on top of that. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's a wonderful question. And you're putting your finger on something that I've been desperately, that I desperately try to avoid in the book and here, which is um, metaphysics. And that is the discussion of our relationship to the world, which is what the question of, especially the traditional notion of truth, plunges us straight into. Because in the West, the, the most important um, definition, understanding of truth is, uh, is that um, it's a representation of, the truth it applies to statements and that the statements are true when they correspond to the state of affairs in the world. There are, I, from my point of view, disastrous metaphysicals and, uh, metaphysical and psychological um, consequences of believing that you are, talk about filter bubbles, which is a Eli Pariser book that is about the echo chamber. Um, talk about filter bubbles, the, the truth bubble where you are living in a representation of the world um, that e either is, or either does or does not correspond to the world. Even if it does correspond, you're not living in the world. You're living in, in, a, in a bubble. And this is maybe the founding insight of um, Martin Heidegger was that there's something crazy about about untrue, deeply untrue about this idea of truth. Um, and uh, in the past 60 years of philosophy have been, in many ways, the most important, many of the most important ideas are addressing this representational idea of truth. So the, the, the relation to knowledge, first of all, is an obvious one, because knowledge is knowledge of, you know, of true things, um, it gets a little bit to what Ethan was saying which is, uh, there's a question that I, I don't want to address in the book or anywhere, later in life, such as it is or, or now, um, because I don't know how to. It's too hard for me. But it's the extent to which the 
nature of knowledge, on, of network knowledge as something that is inherently messy, messy and contains difference and disagreement and is in many ways stronger because of that as well as having the disastrous consequences that Ethan raises. Um, whether that is not, not only representative, if that is not only truer to what it means to be a human in the world, whether in fact it is in fact a better representation of the world, whether the world is in fact messy and contradictory um, uh, in ways that we, that postmodernists have been talking about and that um, are too difficult for me to understand. Robert Dunton, I think I saw your hand up. Um, what, what I enjoyed, uh, among many other things, David, in your presentation was what makes us uncomfortable, namely the utter chaos of knowledge. Uh, endless data points swimming around. My question concerns what I sensed, maybe wrongly, to be a missing dimension. Not philosophy, not data points, but what you could call social science. Uh, and I would give you a, one example from Edmund Leach. He asked the question, why are you insulted if I call you a son of a bitch? And are you not insulted if I call you a son of a cow? There is a kind of energy that has to do with the way categories hang together or do not hang together. And your notion that we can do without categories, that we can live in a world of sheer data points swirling around, seems to me to radically misrepresent the way societies operate. We all have categories, they're imperfect, but I think part of the effort to understand the human condition is to see the way we organize life through classification systems, going back to the old card catalogs of the libraries, and modify those categories, fight about them, and sometimes when it comes to questions of race and so on, fight fiercely about them. So my challenge would be, how would you answer Edmund Leach's uh, provocation? Uh, I would apologize for misspeaking. Uh, I, I fully acknowledge the importance and um, the, in some ways the primacy, I want to shade this in a moment, the primacy of categories. It's absolutely right. Language is impossible without having something like categories. So uh, in, by no means do I think that we encounter the world as a swirl of data individually or collectively and that we somehow swim through this sea of disconnected or overly connected data points. I, I don't, that's not at all what I, what I think. So I've put this badly. Um, the argument I think to be had is with the old notion that there is a single right category. That is the failure to recognize that categories are, are in fact expressions of, of interest, what matters to you. Um, that the world matters to us, and the primary fact is the world matters to us. We care about what happens to us. We care about what happens to other people, unless we're sociopaths, and we'll leave them aside. Um, and in, in response to these issues of, of care, what matters to us, what interests us at the moment, we um, categorize the world quite fluidly. We always have. We, we've, we've always done that because we've had to. But we've also had a countervailing um, philosophy that has said some of, some of these categories have to be real. Some of these categories are the real thing. And to know what something is is to see what the correct category is. And so we still, we have debates about whether bloggers are journalists or not. It's a category question. Many things hang on it, and so we need to have the debate, but the question isn't really which category does it go in. That's not solvable. There is no one right answer to that question. Um, what matters is, well, how are we gonna treat them? That's what matters. We have arguments about Pluto, whether Pluto is a planet, whereas uh, the, if you are an astronomer, which I am not, um, you don't much care about the category planets. What you care about is perhaps uh, big objects in space that have atmospheres because you care about weather. You're studying extraterrestrial weather. That becomes a very important category to you. Not to me, because uh, I'm not studying that. Um, things you can see at night on a, uh, that are romantic or that you could put a, a telescope on and it will enlarge in a useful way. That's an interesting category if you're out at night and you want to do that. 
those cat those so we you need those categories, but the notion that there is a single right category and that the way to knowledge and truth is to discern those is the idea that we have given up before the net, but the net has kicked to smithereens, and I think quite usefully. And the one little addendum I'd add to that is um, Eleanor Roche um, has con persuaded me, convinced me to some degree that actually even thinking about this as categories is probably not quite the right idea. We probably actually think about things in terms of pro prototypical objects around which we cluster, but it has the same basic effect. It leaves us not in a swirl of data atoms, and it's, it's just a series of categories based or, or prototypes based upon our interests and our projects. Paralleled with the explosion of the web came the importance of personal relationships, personal information, not only as a uh, filtering or, or tr um, valuing mechanism, but really you know, the people saw new ways of building community, new ways of building a sense of self, new ways of building a sense of understanding, not only in the context of this broad uh, ocean of, of data, but just in terms of getting on with life. And so coincident with that first came lots of things of you know, groups that never physically meet and yet have the same sense of intimacy, same sense of purpose and loyalty that uh, old time villages would have. Could you talk a bit about that social dimension to understanding and how that's been manifest in, uh, in these times of so turbulence? I'm easy way out. That was a wonderful question. Um, and talk about what may be way too obvious, but at least I can be brief about it, which is, um, I'll speak for myself. So I, I'm sort of old school, so I'm on lots of mailing lists. That's my social networking, primary social networking tool. You know, I try out others, but I, I'm on mailing lists, um, including Berkman mailing lists. Um, those turn out to be, for me, the primary place that I learn about topics that I know that I'm interested in. So I'm on a mailing list of people who care about FCC policy, and I, it's over my head, uh, but I learn a huge amount by watching people who disagree with them. They have in common that they're speaking English, and they care about the FCC, and they have some general shared body of knowledge, and then they have some lurkers like me, and, but they disagree about policy, and they go at it. So any, any issue that comes up, I hear about first through that mailing list, and I have it explained in a way that I could never, ever, ever have had before mailing lists existed. I wouldn't have had the inclination or time to go read a ton of journal articles about it, go to the library and do that. I just wouldn't have. But now it's, in, it's coming to me, and I watch these minds um, interact based upon some deep knowledge and some shallow knowledge as well. That's where learning happens, and for me, that's where knowledge happens as well. And I suspect that everybody in this room has similar sets whether it's mailing lists or something else, that's where we're learning, that's where we're seeing knowledge development. And in every case, because the internet is almost unique as a medium in that there is, it provides no boundary between information, communication, and sociality, these informational sessions build bonds, social bonds. And so these people become, they may be odd sort of friends, but that is roughly the right word to use for these people who I have not met. There was just no barrier between those three things. And because we're human beings, we don't like barriers between information. We don't like information enough to try to keep it in its box. We want it to turn into communication. We want it to turn into sociality, so, mm -hmm. it, so it does. Just a footnote to that. David and I have been Super on Super short, though, thank you. Uh, just a, a footnote. That David and I have been on the same mailing list for a dozen plus years, and that's how I found out about this. Fabulous. That is now I know who you are. It's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> That's some serious code going on. Awesome. Um, please join me in thanking David Weinberger and congratulating him on no. his book. Thank you. Thank you so much.